Welcome everybody to the Australian Society for Computers and the Law first event for 2021, which also happens to be the Society's 40th anniversary. Uh, so this is a special year for us. And to start this special year, uh, we have a really exciting expert panel discussion for today with distinguished panelists from academia, private sector and the government. We're joined by colleagues from across Australia and the world, and we would like to pay our respects to each of the traditional custodians of the land upon which we meet, past, present and emerging. The discussion today is on uh, the future of transport, navigating on an autonomous and connected future. From academia and our moderator for today, we have Professor Tanya Lehman, who is Dean of Law at Flinders University and serves as a member of various legal technology and autonomous vehicle committees and groups. From the private sector, we have Nick Carney, who is a partner at Herbert Smith Freehills and co-leads Herbert Smith Freehills Global Future Cities Initiative, as well as is a member of the Australian National Transport Commission's Industry Engagement Group for Autonomous Vehicles. And providing a government and regulatory perspective, we have Katie McLaughlin, who is a Principal Advisor, Emerging Technology and Road Safety to the New South Wales Minister for Transport and Roads. Amongst other responsibilities, Katie has responsibility for legislative and policy reform agenda for technology related matters across the Minister's portfolio. Before I hand over to Tanya, I would like to just go over some housekeeping rules. The panel, this panel discussion is being recorded uh, and a link to the recording will be posted after the discussion. We ask that people please keep themselves on mute and, and keep your cameras off as well. And there will be a chance to, for questions at the end of discussion, but if you do have a particularly burning question, please use the chat function. Tanya, with that in mind, I'll hand over to you now to set the context for the discussion. Thanks, Tanya. Thanks very much, Thomas, and welcome one, and thank you for your interest in joining us. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be part of a panel with Katie and Nick um, this evening. So some of you may be completely new to this whole notion of uh, future mobility, future transport. And so we thought it would be useful just to set the context by um, defining a few terms and just explaining some of the work that's going on um, in Australia. So the most commonly used taxonomy is that that's uh, been developed by SAE International, um, their international standard J3016, if you're interested. And that really sets out six levels of automation when we're talking about automated driving. So level zero is the human does everything, the sorts of cars that I drove around in when I was a small child, uh, when there wasn't even power steering. Uh, level five at the opposite end of the spectrum is full automation, where the vehicle does everything, uh, there's not even a driving wheel, and someone just gets in the vehicle as a passenger or an occupant, or maybe not even a human being, but cargo is transported. And so in between that level of zero at one end and five on the other, there are four other levels. So level, level one is where there are, <coughs> excuse me, the, the, the driver is assisted by things like electronic braking, but really has responsibility for all of the other operation of the vehicle, uh, the dynamic driving task, as it's called. The next level, level two, is what's called partial automation. And many of the late model vehicles on our roads have things like reversing cameras or lane assist or forward collision warning, and they would be described as a level two vehicle. Level three, we're talking about conditional automation, where the, and, and the, the definition there is that there is the driving mode specific performance by an automated driving system of all aspects of the vehicle's operation, but the expectation that a human can intervene when required or respond uh, when required. High automation is a broader operation where the, the vehicle is doing everything, but again, um, the human, it will take over even if the human driver doesn't respond appropriately. So we've got six different levels. Uh, the, the, the most uh, modern vehicles on our roads are about the level two vehicles. So what's happening in Australia? And I, I don't claim to speak on behalf of these organisations, so I just want to acknowledge the work that they're doing and point you in the direction of their websites because they are doing excellent work. So Austroads has been working on future mobility and particularly on co cooperative intelligent transport systems uh, since 2011 at least. 
And they've been working on things like safety benefits of collision avoidance technologies, interoperability of systems, infrastructure like digital mapping, um, recognition of road signs, road marking, the registration, licensing, and insurance issues around automated vehicles and traffic sign recognition. They're also working on projects involving heavy automated vehicles in remote and regional areas. And we know in this country, some of our remote mines lead the world in the use of fully automated vehicles. They also have projects on privacy, data and cybersecurity and driver training. And the, the most recent publication guidelines for automated vehicle tr trials was published um, in conjunction with the National Transport Commission. Now, again, I refer you to the National Transport Commission website. They've been working at least since 2016. They did a review in 2016, which identified over 700 barriers in current legislation to the deployment of automated vehicles on our roads. And our laws presume that we would have a human driver in control. So one of their key areas of focus is identifying and removing regulatory barriers to new innovative transport services. The transport ministers agreed in May 2018 that Australia is going to develop a purpose-built national law to regulate on-road operation of vehicles. And in June 2020, it was agreed that that national law will establish a national regulator who will be responsible for regulating uh, automated vehicles on the road through a general safety duty. And that's a general safety duty that will operate on an automated driving system entity. The National Transport Commission or NTC is, is currently working on more projects. Three re reform projects are on the go at the moment around in-service safety, motor accident injury insurance and government access to detailed data. In other countries, uh, in the US, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration is uh, working in this area. And of course, they have multiple states, many more than Australia. And so um, as far as I'm aware, that has been a bit of a challenge getting everyone on the same page. In the UK, in 2018, they passed the Automated and Electric Vehicles Act. Um, and there is also the Government Centre for Connected and Autonomous Vehicles. In Australia and New Zealand as well, we have um, ADVI, the um, Autonomous Vehicles... So, ADVI, I've just forgotten the acronym, sorry, <laughs> strangely. And that's the peak industry advisory body. There's over 150 industry partners from um, areas such as automotive, insurance, transport, motoring, parking, communications, banking, logistics, defence, um, technology and local, state and national government. So there are many, many implications when we're thinking about um, future mobility and in particular automated vehicles. Adri, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Thank you, Glenn. Australia and New Zealand Driverless Vehicles Initiative. Thank you very much for that. Uh, a mental blank when you've, you're so familiar with the uh, acronym that you don't forget to write it down. So what we'd like to do now is just hear briefly um, from Katie, Nicholas and I about our differing perspectives. So Katie's going to give us a few minutes about a government perspective on these issues. And Nicola will, Nicholas will bring us a practitioner and industry perspective. And then I will talk about um, academic um, policy perspectives that are being um, discussed. And then we're going to think about three broad themes, safety, trust and regulation. And we welcome your comments or questions. Uh, and if you can please add those into the meeting chat as we're going through and we'll, we'll try and address those at the appropriate time. But if I can hand over now to Katie to give us uh, a government perspective, please. Hi there, thanks so much, Tanya. And um, thank you to Marina and the team. Appreciate being here with everybody today. Um, look, from, a, I guess, a government perspective as a regulator and enabler, um, when we're thinking about new modes of, of transport or existing modes of transport, we try to think about things from both, um, I suppose, from an economic and a social policy perspective um, in relation to whatever regulation is required um, or, or whatever um, 
changes are required. Uh, from an economic perspective, we have to consider things uh, from an, uh, obviously from an infrastructure perspective. So um, what does um, emerging technology uh, mean for, um, for example, we get to be quite creative. What, you know, what does a road look like from here in? Um, if a driver, if we're talking about those higher um, levels of autonomy um, where a driver is not required, what, what, is, what is that? What is, what is, you know, when you, what is the design of a, of a vehicle look like? And we talk a lot about um, point to purpose. So if a, if a, if a vehicle doesn't have to have um, a, a driver's seat or a dash or anything like that with those high uh, levels of autonomy, then, then what does the, the design look like? Because that has a significant impact um, on, uh, you know, what does a road <laughs> look like? Uh, also things in terms of um, when we look at smart cities and, in, and smart infrastructure, um, as you mentioned, um, Tanya, collaborative infrastructure, uh, uh, infrastructure and um, technology systems, you know, a vehicle isn't just um, an island. How are they talking to other vehicles? How are they talking to other things? And how are they talking back to a base? And alongside that, um, we, we talk a lot about the governance of data. And I know we'll talk a little bit more through the session about the, the concept of trust um, alongside safety and things like that. Um, we also need to look at um, enforcement and li liabilities from a safety perspective. Um, how can we ensure that the, that the um, roads or, or new modes of transport are um, safe for everybody? Um, we have to consider things like, you know, uh, are we looking to regulate privately owned vehicles or are we considering government um, or commercial fleet um, or, and or both? Uh, and what does that future look like? Um, and also we need to think about what does the legislation prescribe? So from a legislation perspective, you know, we, we tend to be, or legislation typically tends to be quite reactive um, as opposed to proactive, which is a constant <laughs> struggle of um, policy makers um, and legislators. But uh, we are currently going through a process of trying to identify how can we make the legislation technology or mode agnostic so that as the technology develops, uh, the, the legislation is enabling and not having to continuously play catch up. So for example, an issue came up the other day and we had in relation to um, connected and autonomous vehicles and we had to consider what is the concept of a key um, or for enforcement perspective, you know, do you, what do you need to do to a vehicle to um, immobilize it? Um, so that was an, that's an interesting um, example of something we need, we need to consider. From a social policy perspective, we need to consider things like, um, well, what is the concept of a journey or what is the commute um, moving forward? So interestingly, COVID gave us um, a lot of pause to think about. It, it sort of um, gave us an insight into um, uh, what the world might look like uh, if people didn't necessarily have to um, get into a car, at least to the volumes that we see currently. So during um, April of last year, we saw a 40% reduction of um, the volume of traffic on the roads in New South Wales. Um, and we had to consider things like, so when we talk about autonomous vehicles and other modes of transport, we talk about point to purpose. So if you don't have to perform the dynamic driving task as a, as a human and a vehicle could potentially do that for you, then what are you doing while you're in that vehicle? So, for example, you know, you could be um, taking calls and doing business meetings, which a lot of people probably do already <laughs> with the current technology in their cars. You know, could they be watching movies? Is it recreational time? Is the purpose of the um, commute for, for tourism purposes? Is it transit? Is it freight? Um, you know, the concept of autonomous vehicles from a commercial perspective um, in terms of platooning and freight te uh, technology developments is really interesting as well. Um, the other thing I'll say is that we talk a lot about, I mean, I've been part of a lot of sessions um, in relation to autonomous vehicles where we consider it as a futuristic thing. Um, and I'd like to just um, say firmly that it is not. <laughs> um, we deal with issues relating to um, uh, new uh, you know, autonomous driving technologies um, on a daily basis. We have a, um, uh, a driver testing facility or a car testing facility, so Transport for New South Wales through the Centre for Road Safety, they um, will certify um, vehicles with an ANCAP um, safety rating. And we've recently had to upgrade um, our facility, our test lab, um, to accommodate new technologies because the safety ratings have changed um, to reflect um, technologies that make it safer 
um, for people to drive on the roads and the vehicles that incorporate that, those technologies in them. So um, we also have to think about user groups. That's the other thing I'll, I'll, I'll just mention. So I, I suppose there's an assumption that, that everybody might <laughs> use an autonomous vehicle um, and that might not necessarily be the case. There will be some early adopters, there might be some laggards. Um, we've got to think about um, that kind of thing from a government perspective. We ran a trial um, up in Lismore um, over the last um, couple of months and uh, it was really interesting. It was actually around a retirement village and that was using a shuttle with a, an assistant on board. Um, but um, the elderly participants of that trial absolutely loved using the vehicle. The feedback we had was that it gave them back a sense of um, independence because they didn't have to rely on a human to call up and say, can you come and pick me up to go to my art class or therapy session or whatever the thing was. So there's a lot that we have to consider from a government perspective. Um, paramount is safety. Um, as I mentioned, um, infrastructure and the dollars. So, you know, we constantly face the conundrum of at what point do we make an investment in infrastructure and will we get a return on that investment? Um, so it's tricky from a technology perspective as you are investing in technologies that are developing at rapid pace. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're just a couple of the things that, that we need to consider. Thanks very much for that insight, Katie. That's uh, really helpful in, in setting the complexity of the issues that you're juggling um, and some unexpected ones probably for some of us. Uh, handing over to Nick now, if you can give us a practitioner industry perspective, um, particularly in your role as uh, a partner at a major law firm who's advising um, major clients on some of these issues. Um, thank you very much, uh, Tanya, and, uh, and and good evening to everybody. And um, thank you very much to the Society for inviting me. Um, I, find, I think this is one of the most exciting topics that I get to talk about and deal with clients on. Um, my particular interest is is a private sector um, interest, and 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 by that, what I mean is that I'm interested in how private sector um, companies navigate potential um, regulatory frameworks to develop and deploy connected and autonomous technology or autonomous vehicle technology. Um, how the regulation um, that we're, we're, we're thinking about and talking about today and that Katie and the, and, and the various governments around the countries will affect the way in which um, AV technology will be deployed by the private sector and also the business models that are likely to flourish under those regimes. And when we think about those issues, I think it's really important to, to recognise that the private sector is, you know, is a multi multifaceted um, beast and that in relation to the deployment of AV technology at scale, there will be a lot of parties involved. So this will include um, OEMs, which stands for Original Equipment Manufacturers, um, infrastructure owners, Katie just talked about um, the role that infrastructure plays in this and the role that smart infrastructure or connected infrastructure will play in this. And some of that infrastructure is owned by government, some of it's owned by the private sector. Um, uh, in addition, you've got um, investors. So you'll have equity investors, you'll have financiers um, who, who, um, who, who will be interested in how these um, technologies are, are developed and then deployed at scale. And, and another entity or another group to think about are insurers. Um, what is the role of insurers and how do insurers make money um, out of this? And I don't mean that in a bad way. Insurance is a really important um, tool and uh, and so you've got to get the, the regime right and understand the role that insurance can sensibly play in this. And the other thing that that is really important that I think is worth noting is a lot of the parties that I just mentioned will be working across multiple uh, jurisdictions. And so I don't just mean different states and territories in Australia, um, but, but actually um, different jurisdictions around the world. So one exercise we did last year was for a, um, a, a car manufacturer who asked us to do a, a mapping exercise of automated vehicle regula regulations in, I think it was about 46 jurisdictions around the world. Um, and, and 
you know, part of that is them doing a risk assessment and them feeding in um, the, the, the outcomes of that into their business plans and their strategies. Um, so I think that's really important that Australia, well, Australia is an island, um, which has been a great benefit during COVID, but it's not necessarily an island uh, in, in the sense that that um, we are not a technology leader or a technology maker as a country. We are a technology taker when it comes to autonomous vehicles. So we need to have some regard to that. And, and, and what I help clients do is think about the risks and the opportunities involved in um, making a decision to deploy autonomous vehicle technology or smart infrastructure technology. So with risk, the question is, what are the risks? And then who, which party is then best to manage those risks? And in terms of the opportunities, what are those opportunities and how do you pursue them? How do you exploit them? Um, the key risks that my clients think about a lot are the big, the big one, the, the L word uh, that Katie mentioned, which is liability. So who has liability? Um, who should have liability? Who is best placed to manage um, and, and accept particular liability? Um, can insurance assist in, in that risk in relation to liability? Safety is another important risk. What, what is the safety standard required? What are the consequences of failing to meet those standards? Privacy is, is a big one in, in this space, but in so many other spaces involving technology at the moment. Um, Cybersecurity, if you ask my stepfather, who's in his late 70s, what the biggest concern about autonomous vehicles is, he's convinced that the car, the first autonomous vehicle he gets into will be hacked. Um, I'm not sure if he's annoyed some hackers out there or why he thinks he's such a target, but that that's a real, that's a real issue is how do you give confidence around cyber? Um, we have this across all our contracts at the moment. And generally the view is nobody can say that they can defend against all cyber attacks. Um, so the question is, 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 is what is the standard you're expecting and how do you respond? And then the final thing around regulatory really quickly is certainty. The clients that I'm talking to are looking for certainty because they're making decisions about deploying um, um, deploying funds and making investments um, with a with a 10 or, or, or longer year horizon. So they don't want to go and invest and find that in four years time, the regulatory framework changes and everything they've invested in is no longer relevant. Very quickly, I'd like to touch on the opportunities that my clients are really focused on. One is data. There's so much data created by all the sensors and the videos um, and, the, and the movement of, of autonomous vehicles. And that data is very rich um, data and, and people are, are, are thinking about how they can use that data and what that data, um, how that data could be monetized, um, but also how it can be used to make the technology work better, which is very important. Intellectual property is obviously very important. And the trickiest bit um, that I've found on transactions involving um, you know, the autonomous vehicle transactions I've worked on so far are that you've got different parties bringing different IP and it's that it's that new um, IP that's developed in partnership and between different parties thinking about who owns that um, and how the benefits of that should be shared and, and the other opportunity is around speed to market and the network effects that follow and and again the final one is infrastructure digital infrastructure um, uh, the, who owns it and, uh, and 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 how do we um, and how do we invest in that and, and make that happen? Um, and all of this feeds into the business models that will that will likely succeed. And my bet is still on the idea that the, the business model will involve fleets of robo taxis. Um, I don't think the, the mass market for autonomous vehicles is in individuals owning them themselves, but but rather using them. Um, a bit like a, um, a, a ride hailing service, um, like Uber, for example. Um, so that, that's really our, what, what I wanted to cover from, from what my clients are thinking about and how I work with them around it, and the, the, the varied range of issues that those clients are interested in. So I'd be happy to talk further about them or other issues throughout. Thanks very much, Nick. And last of all, my perspective uh, as a legal academic. So I come from a background initially when I was in practice as a personal injury lawyer, dealing with a lot of motor vehicle accidents. And I've been teaching tort law for far too long um, <laughs> that I can remember. So tort law, of course, um, 
spends a lot of time thinking about the law of negligence and how we're going to allocate uh, the loss that's born when someone gets something wrong. So I bring that perspective to it, but I think there are a number of uh, people all over the world in uh, the legal academic space who are thinking uh, about autonomous vehicles from a number of different legal lenses. But really, I think this is part of a bigger conversation about how the law should respond to emerging technology. So what are the rights? What are the obligations? Who are the winners? Who are the losers? What are the things that we need to work out, uh, look out for? And particularly, this is wrestling with how uh, we think about the law either as acting on a break uh, on innovation to stop things from happening, either because uh, we're protecting people or protecting industries, or the law as an instrument of facilitating an innovation and introduction of new things. So the key issues that are being discussed in multiple now, multiple academic articles, are particularly the issue of liability. I, I think that's the sexy issue, and many of you will have, have um, heard of the trolley problem, which is an old uh, legal hypothetical, which is being used often in this context of autonomous vehicles. The issue around insurance and how we think about our, our legal systems is um, another important one that's being discussed, as, as Nick has mentioned. This notion of control becomes really important, not only for private law like negligence, but also for criminal law and how we manage um, responsibility for things like breaches in uh, road rules, if that's the case, if that happens. Um, and I think all of the time is, <laughs> yes, Glenn, I see your comment there, the road rules break the trolley problem. Um, I think there's, there's always the, the, the risk for all of us who come from a legal background is do we know enough about the actual technology and how it works to really have something sensible to say about all of those things. And I think whether or not uh, we get right into the technology, there are these broader issues around how law should respond to emerging technologies. And the discussions around autonomous vehicles really are a model for other issues around liability for other types of autonomous systems and for robots uh, particularly. And, and something else that's of particular interest to me now is what new skills, if any, will lawyers and legal advisors and other, uh, other legal professionals need as they are engaging with this changing landscape? So um, I think we all bring different perspectives and I'm sure that there'll be many other different perspectives uh, listening on the call this evening. So. Let's turn now to our three broad themes, safety, trust and regulation. So I'll throw this open to Nicholas and Katie now. How should we th be thinking about safety? You've both talked about safety, but how should we be thinking about this notion of safety in the context of autonomous vehicles? Are we thinking about passengers? Are we thinking about infrastructure? How safe does, does safe have to be? Does it have to be 100% safe 100% of the time? Your thoughts on either of that? Um, perhaps if we can go first to, to Nick, I saw you open your mouth and then we'll go to Katie. Um, thanks very much, Tanya. I, I mean, uh, the way I, I tend to think about it um, is, um, is, is beginning with some of the data now it, it, and really in, in thinking about how safe is safe enough um, because regulators will need to make a decision about when to allow autonomous vehicles on our roads. So what the stats say is that somewhere between 90 and 94% of road deaths are caused by human error. So just think about and just reflect on that for a minute. Um, the, the second stat that's worth noting is um, on average over the last sort of five, six years, there've been 1,200 people killed on Australian roads um, each year. I think last year it dropped to about 1,106, but still it, it's pretty stubbornly above 1,000 deaths on the road. And then the third figure is that the estimated cost of road trauma in Australia was about 30 billion in 2018. So if, if human error is responsible for between 90 and 94 percent of road deaths and autonomous vehicles can take out that risk of human error then 
you know, just based on a fairly simple mathematical equation, you could really see a ninefold drop in the number of fatalities on the road, all other things being equal. Um, the, 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 the other, that then sort of leads to the question, um, if you are to um, allow autonomous vehicles on the roads and, you know, while they knock out human error, they, they have some other problems and the number of deaths drops from, from 1,200 to 600 fatalities, do you get 600 thank you notes or do you get 600 lawsuits? Um, and that's one of the challenges, I think, of, of, it, of introducing um, new technology. So that, that's probably my my reflection on the question of how safe is safe enough. And where that leads me to is that, you know, that there is a really strong case for allowing autonomous vehicles on our roads. Um, we just need the right regulatory system in place um, to do so. Katie, Katie, your thoughts from a government perspective on how safe is safe enough? Yeah, look, I mean, I also deal with uh, road safety as, as one of my um, key vertical responsibilities. And just, you know, touching on um, what Nick was saying, um, you know, if you remove that that human element, there's there's no doubt that, that uh, human error is accountable for the, the majority of um, uh, road fatalities um, that we have in New South Wales and uh, Australia. Interestingly, um, what I will say is that uh, in terms of the biggest factors for um, death, um, it's by far and away speeding, followed by fatigue, uh, distraction and, and intoxication. And you add any of those elements to speed again, and it's, it's like triple um, the chance of, of death on the road. Interestingly, again, um, I mentioned earlier in my introduction that during COVID, it, is, it gave us some interesting insights in relation to congestion and volumes of traffic on the road and how the, the transport system coped in those things. One of the insights, I mentioned that um, we saw a 40% volume uh, reduction, uh, sorry, reduction in volume of traffic on the roads in April of uh, uh, 2020. But as, uh, even scarier um, is that we did not see a dip, a correlating dip in the um, number of speeding infringements on the road. So, I mean, it's interesting to think of when you take, you know, people out of that dynamic, off that dynamic driving task, unless you take everybody um, away from that task um, and leave that to the vehicle. It, I mean, from what we've seen alone, um, Anecdotally, it, it's shown us that as long as there are some people on the roads, um, those who are willing to take risks, um, it may not necessarily um, mean a, a wholly safer outcome for everybody. Um, so uh, it, it really, I mean, we, as a government, we have to be con concerned for, for the community at large. Um, and, you know, we do our best to balance <laughs> competing interests, but, but fundamentally, I think, um, you know, autonomous driving technologies are absolutely going to be a benefit, but how do we, you know, um, pair that with a broad community um, education and awareness campaign so that perhaps there isn't a degree of complacency? Um, we're still trying to figure out why there wasn't um, a, redu a correlating reduction in um, uh, imprint, speeding, specifically speeding infringement levels um, during that period of um, the uh, drop in the volume of traffic on the roads. And again, like the first things that we are, uh, that seem to be coming through are that um, because um, there was, there were fewer and fewer um, cars and buses and whatever vehicles on the road, people seem to think that it was a, a safer environment in which to speed. And the, the concept of speaking from a psychological perspective, and I'm not a psychologist, but I've spoken to a lot of um, qualitative um, and um, uh, road psychology is a really interesting field. And we have a lot of very smart people within the Centre for Road Safety and stuff else who love to talk about this kind of thing. But the, the, the psychology behind speeding is that individuals um, tend to not see uh, the um, speed on the roads as an indication of what is a safety rating effectively for that stretch of road, in, just from a speeding perspective. And individuals do not see speeding to overtake another vehicle or to get out of an, um, a dangerous situation as speeding. The average Joe, and I'm generalising hugely here, but from our um, you know, um, focus groups and things like that, it, 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 speeding seems to be hooning 
or um, behaving intentionally dangerously on the road, and that's just not the case. So um, really, it's it's uh, I think when an individual assesses a situation where there may not be other drivers on the road, or if they were to see there's lots of autonomous vehicles on the road, so this is a safe situation within uh, which I can drive faster and it's still safe, or I'm not technically speeding, um, then then we may not see um, a drop in um, infringement levels on the road and fatalities, unfortunately. Well, hopefully we'd see a drop in fatalities just by virtue of fewer people um, driving on the road. But but the the um, preliminary evidence we have to suggest through that insight through COVID and the significant drop um, in the volume of traffic is almost counter um, to that assumption that we had made. So it's really, really interesting for us from a safety perspective. Thanks, Katie. One of the things that I find really interesting is when we think about where we might go in future is actually to, to spend a little bit of time looking back at what's happened in the past. And so if we're thinking about how we might um, improve safety in our vehicles and in, in mobility, we've got the 1970s where we introduced seatbelts and then there was uh, a reduction in uh, deaths and serious injuries. And then there were some common law claims around contributory negligence for people not wearing a seatbelt. And then there was gradual regulation. And then we had laws requiring people to wear seatbelts. And I see a question from um, Linda there to Nick about, will people take more risks? Well, that was one of the arguments that was raised in the 70s about seatbelts. If people are going to wear seat, are forced to wear seatbelts, everyone's going to take more risks on the road. And so we've jumped to talking in our conversation just now about fully autonomous vehicles, level five vehicles. But right now we have vehicles with airbags or electronic stability control, where the data is now showing that those technologies can significantly improve safety. And reversing cameras can significantly improve safety. So a question that really interests me is when should the law start saying, well, we've already got technologies that we should mandate and require everyone to have them. But as soon as we're saying, well, everyone has to have a car that has a reversing uh, camera or has forward collision warning or has lane assist or has um, uh, electronic stability control or whatever, we're now, we're now imposing on people something that's very different to just pulling a seatbelt on. And so there's, there's some really interesting policy questions there. Are we, are we thinking about waiting until we get to this full level of full autonomy where, where everyone's going to be safer before we start thinking about how we might really use the law to nudge adoption of safer technology here and now? So I, um, that question was addressed to you, Nicola. Nick, I'll read it out for um, Katie's um, benefit. Question for Nick, if autonomous vehicles are perceived to be safer in that they reduce human error to improve safety ninefold, does it really hold that there would be 600 fewer fatalities if human behaviour adjusts to perceived improvements in safety and the driver, in fact, takes more risks? Is that one of the issues that could lead you to the 600 lawsuits you mentioned? So a quick comment from Nick. And yeah, I think, I mean, I, think, Katie. I mean, I think, you know, um, if human error, well, until you get to level five automation, so fully autonomous vehicles, you're going to have a human kind of doing something or rather. Um, and, and we've seen, you know, we saw with the Uber fatality that happened in the US in March 2018 that was very, very tragically caught on camera that, you know, there was a, a combination of factors, including the fact that the driver was in, meant to have their, their hands on the steering wheel, they were meant to be looking forward and they weren't. So as Katie said, the, the big challenge is not um, when we have all autonomous vehicles on, on the road that are smart enough to be talking to each other and taking all human error out. The big challenge is while so long as we have drivers um, who are, um, I guess, sharing control of a vehicle um, with an autonomous system, and while so long as we have um, um, you know, traditional cars on the road with autonomous cars, it's that, it's that that's the tricky bit. That's the really hard bit that Katie and her and her team and the minister are grappling with. And I, I, I think you know, I, th I think it's it's important. I don't want to just, I don't want to sort of wave that away and pretend that's not a real issue. That is. Perhaps if I can jump in there and give you this question from Matt, uh, Katie. 
Autonomous only roads are safer than mixed. Autonomous only lanes exist now in China. Is that something that we should consider in Australia? Look, Transport for New South Wales is considering a whole bunch of different um, options. We've, um, I met recently with a really interesting company called Cavenue. Um, they're reasonably early stage, but they have an interesting concept of um, creating um, uh, a dedicated lane for cab level three and above cars. And effectively, when you um, uh, transfer or, or change into those lanes, <coughs> Um, you you effectively turn on whatever your um, autonomous driving technology is, so whether that's cruise control or um, driver assist, and uh, it's perhaps you know faster speeds available on that um, stretch of road. But the way that they're talking about it is that that would have to be part of um, an existing um, road network. Um, the concept of fully autonomous. Um, uh, roads is interesting. I think, you know, we talked earlier about investment in infrastructure and we have, um, I guess, the the interesting conundrum in Australia, you know, we have face the tyranny of distance and density. Um, you know, the government can't pay for all autonomous vehicles on the road or for everyone to have one or to have access to one. Um, and the infrastructure associated is, is very expensive. So, of course, we look to partner, as we do with other infrastructure projects, with the private sector. And we work with the OEMs or, um, you know, the, the new um, categories of um, stakeholders like the, um, you know, the ABS and the ADSEs um, to, to work with us to understand um, where it would be good for us to invest in infrastructure to enable um, or incentivise more people to um, adopt um, vehicles or drive vehicles or, or have a fleet of vehicles with um, autonomous driver um, technologies in them. Um, can I just stress a question that came up earlier? Um, uh, Tanya, you mentioned, can you mandate safer technologies in vehicles or the adoption of those vehicles? You just, like, I, that would be um, nightmarish <laughs> for a government to say, right, we're not having any vehicles other than fully autonomous or even, um, you know, potentially level three and above. Um, vehicles on the road. Um, that's a pretty draconian of a, of a measure, and um, really. And I mean, the cost, the cost as well, Katie. It's not. Cost, it's just it's not you, free, right? No, it's not. It's not free. So, um, no, it's pro it's not really. Um, it's probably not a viable option um, for government uh, to look at, um, despite the fact that you know it, it potentially could lead to um, greater road safety outcomes. But you look at, I mean, you look at um, you know other technologies that are already autonomous to a large degree, and you still see fatalities in relation to those, whether that be um, you know unfortunately in trains or you know um, other other areas. Um, of public transport. So um, we, yeah, I, I just don't think it's really viable for um, at least an Australian government to mandate, even though that would certainly incentivise um, greater participation of OEMs and private um, partners to come and engage with government. Um, but so, that remains an issue for us. So could we see, could we see a situation where Insurance companies, for example, say, well, if you're driving a car that has got all of the autonomous safety features, not necessarily a level three, not a level four, not a level five, but a level two, you know, the most recent vehicle on the market with all the, the bells and whistles in terms of safety, is an insurance company likely to be saying, well, you can have your insurance for cheaper because your car is safer? Absolutely. And we're seeing that to a degree already, and not just in relation to the safety rating of the vehicle, but in relation to the safety behaviour of the individual. Mm. So, you know, with telematics and um, the like, we're seeing, you know, so many trials um, in the insurance sector whereby, you know, is it possible to create truly bespoke and tailored um, um, policies for individuals if they can demonstrate safer driving behaviours. I personally think that should be the case, whether it's um, an autonomous, um, you know, a car with autonomous driving um, technology in it or otherwise, it should be incentivising better driver behaviour. But you're absolutely right, that could potentially incentivise greater uptake of vehicles with those technologies in them. So I want to throw this to you now, Nick. If we've got uh, insurance companies 
using this as a lever to uh, incentivize clients to to act in a particular way or not. Um, how do you advise them around the privacy implications of getting truly bespoke insurance policies that will take into account all the data from that vehicle about who's in the vehicle, where it goes, when it goes there, um, possibly recording of, of conversations in the vehicle. Is there a camera in the vehicle recording the driver or the participants? How, how do you advise clients to think through some of those complexity? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, Tanya, this is already happening. So um, I had an Uber driver a few weeks ago who had front and uh, who had a, a camera pointing out the front and a camera pointing out the back. And he told me that by having that, he uh, he could reduce uh, his his insurance premium. So, I mean, the answer to the privacy question is by consent. Um, um, if, if somebody consents to have their data shared, then they are able to do so. Um, I mean, I think I think that that question is a great question. It's not limited to uh, to autonomous vehicles. It's um, it's a really a here and now a here and now question. We've got another question from Gwen from Glenn. Sorry, can a passenger in an AV compel it to break the law? Now this rate this raises some really interesting questions around um, the Australian road rules and. For, for lawyers, the whole notion of mens rea or guilty mind, do you have to have a guilty mind or do you just have to do an action that's prohibited? Um, and it raises really interesting questions for traffic enforcement agencies. So the police officer in the car driving past, looking at a car behaving in a certain way, having to make an assessment about whether that's um, the technology doing that or it's the occupant of that vehicle causing it to do something. Um, Katie or, or Nick, do you have any comments in relation to that question? Because that, that, that opens up a whole can of worms thinking about the criminal law there. Absolutely. Um, well, I think, you know, it's a really interesting um, question. And, you know, uh, sure, the, the, tech, the technology itself for, um, you know, autonomous driver technologies is developing. But um, so, uh, you know, as long as we have data um, that is also collected, we also have rich insight into what's happening in those vehicles. Um, I don't know how difficult it would be necessarily to um, uh, force a cab level five vehicle to, to behave in a way um, differently to how it should do. But I would um, assume that there would be some record of um, interference or disruption of some degree in that um, uh, car's computer log um, or a record of it, unless there was a very fancy way um, potentially, this comes back to the cybersecurity question, um, Nick, um, of hacking into um, an, an autonomous driver system. Um, if Comments from Nick, perhaps, on that? I, all I would say is just, you know, having watched a lot of heist movies over the years, the getaway driver is always very unreliable. So I'd be encouraged, you know, um, Hollywood bank robbers to use autonomous vehicles would be much more reliable than um, finding the... The, the, the you know the guy at the hamburger store I, I mean i i don't know enough about it i mean i don't know enough about the code but um if it's truly or autonomous it's gonna go where you tell it to go um and it's obviously not going to know that it's part of a, a bank heist um because well, it's a computer in the chat on that nick because the italian job drivers were apparently very reliable <laughs> thinking about the movie heat so uh <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Um, now, we do have a question in the chat or a comment in the chat. AVs will likely be regulated on a state level as a separate vehicle class. True, possibly unlikely or no way. I think when I when I opened up, I did say that the, the transport ministers have uh, agreed that there will be a national approach um, on all of that. Now, that is still being worked out. But uh, Katie and Nick, comments uh, in relation to that query? Well, the oh, fact that at the moment is that these things are regulated at a state level, but of course we it, it's imperative that we collaborate nationally on, on these matters. Um, there have been a number of um, papers and uh, discussion papers and um, consultations happening nationwide um, around um, you know uh, new stakeholders in the liability stakes or um, you know the national regulator and standards um, importantly so that we have a cohesive um, national approach but in terms of the the actual uh, regulatory responsibility it is a state issue um, at the moment 
Okay. Um, now, we've got some other comments in the chat there, uh, particularly from Glenn, about the behaviour of the vehicles and the fact that they can't exceed the speed limit. And, of course, I think this is something that is really interesting for us to think through when we're thinking about road rules, that um, the vehicle will act in the way that it's been programmed to act or it will malfunction. So it won't be making a decision whether it's going to exceed the speed limit or not. Um, this one to you, uh, Nick. A question here from Matt. Will we need regulations to stop people interacting poorly with AVs, such as pedestrians moving in front of an AD? As you know, it will slam on its brakes. I know teenagers would never do this in a CBD. And before you answer that question, when I took my first ride on our um, fully autonomous shuttle on our campus at Flinders, the first thing I did as that vehicle was coming towards me was step in front of it to see whether it actually would stop. So, so I, I did doesn't need stop, teenagers to, to do it. But Nick, do you have comments on that? I mean, I think you, I mean, I think you, uh, I, mean, I, think you um, I mean, it's sort of a funny question, right? Like we don't, we don't have a regulation at the moment to stop people interacting poorly with cars. Like I don't think there's a law against standing in front of a, a car. Um, it may be that we, we, we'll we need them for AVs. Um, hopefully, you know, this is not a huge, you know, hopefully this is not a huge problem. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something to think about. And it raises broader questions too around whether um, the, the introduction of fully autonomous vehicles might take place within a defined um, domain. So there might be a particular geographic limit where the only uh, movement in that limit could be these types of vehicles. And and the, the model for, for things like that, of course, is um, the fully autonomous mine sites where they, they have particular areas where there are just autonomous vehicles and people aren't allowed um, to move there. Tanya, um, I think that kind of goes to Linda's question. She said, who are likely to be the first adopters of autonomous vehicles and what are the factors that will influence mainstream adoption? I mean, I, I guess I guess on this, um, what I would say, it's a great question, Linda, thank you, um, is you're, you're unlikely to see uh, or you're most likely to see autonomous vehicles deployed within particular areas. So it might be they're deployed within our CBD area or a university, like Tanya's mentioned, mm -hmm. because uh, one of the important things is the mapping that the autonomous systems need to do to have confidence about, um, you know, what, what are the, all the roads? What, you know, um, and in really important things like, like you know, down to the millimetre, you know, what, what is... You know, where is the sidewalk, um, things like that, because they need to understand you know, how much room there is and so forth. So it'll actually be, and this is consistent with what's happened in the US, you'll actually see small areas that are, that are eventually expanded mm -hmm. um, for autonomous vehicles, while, particularly while the systems are learning. So it'll be people who live in those areas, there'll be people who, um, who, 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 can, uh, who can afford um, to go in them if there's any premium or, or uh, attached to them at the beginning. Or and use those only... vehicles to move cargo around. Um, can I move to you, Katie? And I've, there's two questions that are very similar. One is um, from Glenn again, a bigger question. All jurisdictions have different road rules. Are they unambiguous, consistent and safe? Can they be rendered into a computer readable form? And then Marina has asked, are we going to avoid, how are we going to avoid the rail track gauge issue with cars? Because of course, cars go over state boundaries. So your comments on that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, you're right, there are different road rules in different um, states, um, but I, I personally don't see that as a, a massive impediment. It's, it's painful, but it, I wouldn't consider it an impediment or, or a barrier to the adoption of autonomous vehicles necessarily. I mean, certainly from a freight perspective, um, from a commercial perspective, it's probably um, uh, quite problematic um, where there are, you know, there's long haul journeys and things like that. But I mean, where, I mean, if you consider, um, you know, if you've got a navigation system in a car at the moment, it will know um, where you are and what you're doing in each, um, in whatever jurisdiction. Um, and by virtue of that, um, I suspect there'll be greater development um, of those technologies to be able to identify what the road rules are in those jurisdictions and either 
um, that be programmed into a, a vehicle by um, virtue of its, of its location um, or um, it will be available for a driver in a lower autonomy um, vehicle, level of autonomy vehicle to ascertain um, and it will be an assistant. So I don't, I don't see that as a, a prohibitor but absolutely it's something that um, we've considered and um, we certainly want to avoid a rail gauge type um, issue and that's why there's been such great um, collaboration nationally on, on mm -hmm. this matter. Yeah, and I, I would second that. I think that's where um, particularly Austroad and National Transport Commission are really leading the way on thinking through this and having a, a really clear program of work there. Now, Nick has uh, made a very interesting comment about the, the, the dog and the pilot on an aeroplane, but what that raises for me is how we as individuals respond to technology. And so our, our levels of trust of it, our levels of assurance, our levels of willingness to engage with it. And there's a whole lot of um, research around the fact that we overestimate how good the tech is or we underestimate uh, how good the tech is and we overestimate our own abilities to make a, an appropriate assessment about all of that. So that raises some really interesting questions, particularly about the data that might be obtainable from vehicle telematics, which tells us exactly what the vehicle is doing or exactly how we drive. Um, there's a question here from Linda to you, Nick. Is that why data is of interest to the private sector to improve data sets for machine learning? I would say yes to that, but how are your clients thinking about perhaps um, managing that data, owning it, sharing it, monetizing it? Yeah, I mean, there's lots of kind of trite phrases out there, like data is the new oil and things like that. Um, at the moment, um, so much data is being collected. People are kind of very, very um, feverishly trying to protect and own it. That, that Most of them haven't quite worked out how to use it. Um, uh, or, or how to how to monetize it might be a better way, but there's a you know there's a lot of things that we've talked about um, today that show the value in the data. You know, the, the, from a safety perspective, from a efficiency and effectiveness perspective, teaching the computer to be be, be faster and, um, and and more efficient. So huge issue, um, really interesting issue on all the deals I'm working on. And look, government. You know, government has an interest in that from a public policy perspective as well. So that, that you know, that's an interesting thought, uh, or at least government has an interest in some of it. Um, so it's quite interesting from a public policy perspective. Now, um, Katie and, and Nick, we're getting the wind up from Marina. We could go on talking about this for a long, long time. So I'm going to ask you both, question without notice, um, the three things, perhaps one or two words, that are really the most uh, important priority for you in this area at the moment. So I'll give you two seconds of thinking time. Um, and Katie, do you want to start off to two or three top priorities? Uh, humans and uh, infrastructure. Uh, Nick? Yeah, I, I, I would say... Um, um, certainty um noting that it's very hard to give certainty um but but like aspiring to give certainty or at least at the direction of where regulatory things are going so people can invest um and uh and and i think um infrastructure as well katie i'm going to steal that and i'm going to steal katie's idea about humans but i'm going to say opportunity but also equity so some of these technologies give people opportunity to be mobile in ways that they can't now, but also the cost and some of the other implications mean that this might not be rolled out equitably. And so that's something for us to think about as a country and as a society. So I think we've used up all of our time now. So I'm going to hand back to um, Thomas. Thanks, Tanya. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Katie. Um, that was a really great discussion. I enjoyed every moment of it. Uh, for those that are interested in reading some of the articles and papers that inform today's discussion, uh, links will be shared on our LinkedIn page. We will also be um, sharing links to register for our next upcoming panel discussion on Rules of, on Code on the 2nd of February, which will be co-hosted by the Allens Hub for Technology, Law and Innovation. 
Um, and the, speak, the discussion will speak, feature speakers from Australia, Canada and New Zealand. Also in February, the Society is uh, proud to support the Innovation and Legal Tech Week, uh, and you can also register via our LinkedIn. As mentioned earlier, uh, we're celebrating 40 years since formation of the first society. Um, and as these panel discussion events show, it's a fantastic time to become involved, network and participate in discussions on emerging issues at the intersection of law, technology and society. Uh, thank you again for our expert panel for their time and insight. And thank you UNSW for allowing us to use your platform. We hope to see you all at the next event.